This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Boomerang. At the center of the feast day festivities, in the middle of the village green, a huge crowd has gathered. As you press your way through the throng, you see what they are watching. A brightly colored halfling woman is beaming to the crowd and brandishing a strangely curved, brightly colored stick. She gives a shout, and at the far end of the green, an onlooker pitches an apple high into the sky. She throws the stick, and it tumbles end over end, tracing a long, curving path. It whistles oddly, and suddenly, it neatly bisects the apple. And then, amazingly, the throwing stick continues to whirl through the air, curving its way straight back to the halfling thrower's waiting hand. You know halflings are talented with throwing weapons, but this is the first time you've ever seen a weapon like this. She called it a boomerang, one of the onlookers says, noticing your stunned expression. Silly name, but what do you expect from a halfling? Hunting is tricky. We've mentioned before that human hunters are pretty much outmatched by absolutely everything they might choose to kill and eat. Most animals that make for good eating are fast, powerful, and knowledgeable about their environments. By contrast, humans are slow, clumsy, weak, and kind of clueless. And yet, you always have that one player who thinks that a sword is a perfectly useful tool for hunting a deer or a rabbit or an owlbear. After all, in Skyrim, it's easy enough to run up to an elk and beat it to death with a few deft sword swings. Yeah, right. The problem is, it's actually kind of tough to get near an animal in the wild. And it turns out that a primary prerequisite for a melee weapon like a sword is getting near something. And that's why it was a major coup for our ancient forebears when someone discovered that you can actually kill things from a distance through the magic of projectiles. And one of the most awesome projectiles, one which seems almost completely magical in its own way, is the boomerang. Yes, spinning winged death from Australia that can not only kill a hawk or a bat or a kangaroo, but that also returns to its thrower. Except that useful boomerangs don't come back. Coming back is a sucky feature for a boomerang. And also, boomerangs aren't technically Australian. At least, they aren't exclusively Australian. It's actually kind of interesting, given the almost pornographic degree to which Dungeons & Dragons weapon lists were populated, that the boomerang is tough to find in D&D. But what's even more odd is that the forerunner of the boomerang has gradually disappeared from explicit mention in D&D. It's especially odd given that video games love boomerangs. And there's so much cross-pollination between video games and D&D, one wonders where the hell all the boomerangs are. Sure, in the Eberron setting, the scorpion-worshipping drow elves of the lost continent of Zendrik had their own specially designed boomerangs. But those things looked more like a three-bladed version of the glaive from the 1983 B-grade sci-fi movie about magical alien throwing stars. Or more likely, like a non-crystalline tchotchke wielded by the Thrykreen of Greyhawk. That's right, we said Greyhawk. Did you think Thrykreen were Athasian? Not so. Sorry. If you don't have any idea what we're talking about with these references, let us explain. At least, let us explain the Thrykreen. We're not going to try to explain Kroll, that's beyond explanation. 
The Thrykreen are a race of four-armed mantis men who got famous as a playable race in the AD&D 2nd edition Dark Sun setting. Dark Sun was sort of a post-apocalyptic fantasy D&D world. Basically, magic had gone kind of crazy and ravaged the entire ecosystem. The world had become a brutal, blistering desert. The gods had abandoned it. Magic was wielded only by very powerful sorcerer kings who ruled the fractious city-states of the setting with iron fists. Often flaming iron fists. Because magic. And psychic abilities were actually more common than magic. And among the playable races were a group of nomadic tribal mantis people called the Thrykreen. They were savage hunters and warriors, and they used unique weapons, often wielding multiple weapons in their four arms. Among them were the overly complicated multi-tined Githka polearm, and a crystal throwing blade called a Chachka which had the unique property of returning to the hunter after it was thrown. Because crystals are magic. Uh, who knows? But the Thrykreen didn't originate in Athos, the world of Dark Sun. Actually, they were created in 1981 by game designer Paul Reich III. Reich, along with his childhood friend, artist Errol Otis, got interested in the emerging D&D game and ended up contributing quite a great deal to the game. Reich helped develop the famous module X1, Isle of Dread, which was basically the Land of the Lost, or Jurassic World if you're not of an age to remember Land of the Lost. Plus, it had spider people and pirates. Reich also developed the Thrykreen for one of the cooler early supplements for Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, the Monster Cards. The Monster Cards were sets of 3x5 cards, each of which featured a single monster. On one side, the card had the statistics for the monster in question. On the other, there was cool full-color artwork depicting the monster. Four sets of 20 cards each were released in 1981 and 1982. A further four sets were planned to feature monsters from the popular Fiend folio, but those sets never materialized. But, apart from some variant drow and some mantis warriors, you'd have a hard time finding a boomerang in D&D. And what's strange about that is that it actually isn't that hard to find a boomerang in the real world. And you don't have to travel all the way to Terra Incognita Australis to find one. By the way, that's what the ancient Greeks called Australia. Even though they had never seen it, they knew it was there because the world didn't tip over. See, the Greeks were pretty sure the world was a sphere, and they knew land was way heavier than water. And they knew they weren't dangling off the bottom of the world. So they figured that somewhere on the other side of the world from Greece and Europe and the Middle East, which was basically all the world they knew about, there had to be a heavy chunk of land to keep everything in balance. And they called that land the Unknown Land of the South. Terra Incognita Australis. And today, we call it Australia, which means South. But we are getting distracted today, aren't we? Let's return to the subject of boomerangs, and rabbit sticks, and shillelas, and knob carries, or knob carries, and King Tutankhamun. As we noted, if you want to be an effective hunter, the best thing you can do is injure or stun or kill a thing from a distance. Once upon a time, the absolute best you could manage for stunning or killing from a distance was a rock. If you could pitch a rock at a bird or a rabbit and stun it, you could run up and kill it and have delicious bird or rabbit meat to eat. 
but thrown rocks have a couple of major limitations. First of all, they don't go very far. And the farther you try to throw a rock, the less powerful it is when it hits whatever you're throwing it at. That's because we inconveniently live in an atmosphere of thick gas we call air. And air slows everything down. Speaking of air, and the inconvenience thereof when it comes to throwing things, the other problem with rocks is that, unless they are shaped just right, they tend to fly in some odd directions as the air gets caught in pits and divots or just gets deflected around the uneven shape of the rock. Air is a wonderful thing if you need to breathe, but it makes projectile-based hunting very hard. But a long, long time ago, Neolithic age long ago, human hunters made an interesting discovery. You could make air work for you, or at least keep it from working against you. If you shaped a thing that would spin through the air, and you gave it a nice even shape and a low profile, you could get it to fly farther and straighter and maintain its power when it hit. And thus was born the throwing stick, or the hunting stick, or the rabbit stick, or the throwing club. The throwing stick was basically just a curved, carved bit of wood designed to tumble through the air and stun or kill a rabbit or a game bird or a squirrel or whatever else you wanted to eat. It was extremely useful. And it was useful in close combat because you could hit a rival hunter over the head with it or use it to finish off the stunned rabbit or pheasant. Throwing sticks evolved all over the world and they basically followed two different patterns. The first pattern was to gradually turn into a throwing club or cudgel or mace. For example, in Ireland, throwing clubs gradually elongated and developed heavy heads. Eventually, as other hunting tools in Ireland supplanted the throwing club, they became long walking sticks known as shalela, which comes from the Irish word salelia, which means long willow. Shalela were not merely walking sticks with heavy heads. They were weapons. Some were hollowed out and filled with lead to make them hit harder. Knobs were added to trap and parry weapons with, and they became a traditional weapon for settling duels. Similarly, in southern Africa, the Nabkiri, which comes from the Afrikaans, meaning ball cane, is a long, narrow stick with a heavy ball at one end. They could be thrown to good effect for use in hunting, and moreover, they were extremely powerful clubs. The knob carry, as it came to be called by European colonials, was a traditional weapon amongst numerous African tribes, including the Zulu. And it was such a ubiquitous weapon in Southern African history that it has appeared on numerous national flags and coats of arms, including those of Lesotho and the Republic of South Africa. Protesters of apartheid in South Africa even carried them as symbols of their heritage. Descendants of Maasai tribes in Eastern Africa relied on the Rungu. The Rungu was a throwing club of similar design to the Shalela and Napkiri, and it was awarded to young Maasai warriors as a symbol of their coming of age. It was also used in a variety of ceremonies. Former Kenyan President Daniel Arap Mohi even carried one at important functions. But there was another evolution of the throwing club. Instead of a heavy head and a straight shaft, in some parts of the world, the clubs became more streamlined and more curved. And that's where we start to see the evolution of the traditional boomerang design. A curved, thin shaft of wood that tumbles end over end through the air. It's this tumbling action that's very important. As the boomerang spins perpendicular to the direction of flight, it stays on course. It flies straight and true, and fast, and it can stun or kill an animal from a great distance. Oddly enough, although we think of the boomerang as an Australian icon, the fact of the matter is that many cultures used boomerangs of the same design, 
and there's evidence that the oldest boomerangs in the world may have been used in Central Europe. But things are quite unclear. The fact is, boomerangs dating between 10,000 and 50,000 years old have been found in Australia, in Poland, in Central Europe, and in the Netherlands. We also have evidence that Native American tribes in California and other western states also employed boomerangs. One of the largest collections of boomerangs ever discovered was in the tomb of Egyptian pharaoh Tutankhamun. So we're not sure who made the first boomerangs. And we're also not sure who made the first returning boomerangs and why they did. See, a useful hunting boomerang flies straight and true, and it hits hard, which means it has to have enough weight behind it to stun or kill an animal. So hunting boomerangs are delicately balanced, heavy, and symmetrical. In order to get a boomerang to return to you, you have to give up weight, symmetry, and a nice straight flight path. Returning boomerangs are airfoils. They have slightly asymmetrical designs to give them long, sweeping elliptical flight paths. Basically, they work like wings. Returning boomerangs have been found amongst Egyptian and Navajo boomerangs and, of course, famously, in the hands of Australian Aborigines. The first accounts of boomerangs in modern writing appear in the late 1700s and early 1800s, when British explorers and colonials encountered them in the hands of Australian Aborigines. They were impressed by the trick throwing of the curved stick that returned to the thrower. And this is where the name Woomerang, or Boomerang, first appeared. Apparently, it derives from a Turawal word meaning throwing and returning stick. However, it's also possible that the name stuck after it was confused for the Woomera, an Aborigine spear launcher which was similar to the Nahuatl spear thrower of Mexico, the Atlatl. It's thought that returning boomerangs were first invented by mistake. An improperly carved and balanced boomerang will trace a curved path rather than a straight path. And if the path is curved enough, it'll curve right back around to the thrower. What's interesting, though, is that the Aboriginal peoples did find hunting uses for the returning boomerang. Because of their sweeping path, if you threw one around behind a flock of birds, you would startle the birds into flying directly at the hunter throwing the boomerang. And if the hunter was ready with a weapon, or had a bunch of friends with nets, you could bring down the startled birds. But, for the most part, Returning boomerangs just aren't much use as direct weapons or hunting tools. Of course, that doesn't mean you can't break the rules for your game. If you want boomerangs in your game, they're basically just throwing clubs. And they are ubiquitous enough that you could hand them out to just about any fantasy culture. And you can rule that a well-thrown boomerang that doesn't hit its target will return to the thrower. But here's the thing. Boomerangs are far less exotic than we think they are. They are about as difficult to use as a sling, and we treat a sling as a simple weapon. So, if a player wants a boomerang, let them have it. They are really cool. I mean, speaking of obscure references, did you ever play Power Blade? Forget the Legend of Zelda if you want to see an awesome boomerang in an 8-bit era Nintendo game. Power Blade was awesome. This has been the GM Word of the Week. It was written by the Angry GM and recorded and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can find more at theangrygm.com and madadventurers.com. 